you know, a late afternoon panel always uh, tends to drag. I hope you guys are all caffeined up. But if you're not, uh, don't worry, this panel has promised a wake-up session for all of us here. Yeah. So with that, I'll dive in. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Gautam Saxena. I'm based in uh, Singapore, uh, former investment banker covering telecom media technology uh, for Asia Pacific. And I now manage an impact fund which focuses on tech-enabled impact in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, I'll run through a quick introduction of uh, my panel. Uh, uh, to my extreme right is uh, Christina Ryson. She's founder and CEO of EduCreators Foundation, based in Switzerland. Uh, followed by Shering Sige Dorji, comes from one of the happiest countries in the world, Bhutan. Uh, he's the ICT domain lead at Desung Skilling Program. Uh, next to him is Savannah Konofsky, director, product and experience at IDEO USA. Um, Next to her is Regina Sipos. She's the EU project lead and research associate at Technique University Berlin. Uh, to her left is Jagannath Kumar, CEO of Reliance Foundation. Uh, and to my immediate right is Prerna Mukharia, founder of Outline India. Um, what we thought we would uh, cover uh, on a very wide brief for the panel, and you know the time is always limited with six panelists, um, is a few topics, including, you know, what do the underserved and the unserved need? Who understands that the best? And those who do, are they uh, agency-driven and are they empowered to deliver the solutions? Uh, are they skilled enough, resourced enough, capital allocated enough, or educated enough to deliver the solutions? Some quick data points. You know, we had the IT minister talk about 800 million um, mobile penetration in India. Uh, that's a great number, but if you peel the onions on that, women are an abysmal less than 10%. Uh, rural India is probably much uh, under 20% there. And all of those are meaningful given women are very significant to these households. Uh, women funded startups globally have less than 2% of capital allocated. Uh, and then we have a number of meaningful impact companies, but are they allowed to run the course to deliver meaningful impact on a sustainable basis? Uh, we also hope to identify some of the key disconnects and the gaps and how we can facilitate uh, and bridge these gaps. Uh, and then another interesting question around, uh, is there a stakeholder disconnect? Um, so, uh, you know, so push for profit and revenue growth versus delivering meaningful impact. Uh, and time permitting, we will then dive into some social entrepreneurship, examples of success, and so on. So kicking off on the first question, and. Um, uh, Regina, I'm going to pick on you. Yeah. Uh, so help us understand, uh, in your perspective, what do the next billion need, right? Uh, and how do we address that segment effectively? Um, right. That is, of course, a very difficult question to answer from an extremely privileged situation living in Berlin, in Germany, right? Um, what do, what can I even remotely know about any of that? Um, so, a little bit of background to, for me, uh, I used to work for the United Nations for a long time um, and the past few years I spent um, researching um, grassroots critical innovation, um, specifically in the Global South. So I'm trying to, you know, engage with exactly those people who are working on these topics. But of course, again, I'm looking at all of this from an extremely privileged point of view and I think that's important to point out. So. Um, the next billion, right? Um, it's definitely something where, um, I hope I'm not derailing the conversation too much with this, but uh, maybe, you know, when you think about startups and exactly those points that you mentioned before um, about, uh, about stakeholder disconnect and all that, maybe the problem is um, that we are looking at, uh, at how, um, how startups can actually address these problems. Because of course, especially in startups, there's a lot of techno optimism um, which often leads to techno-solutionism. Techno-solutionism is the idea that technology can unilaterally solve um, any kinds of issues, especially societal issues. So I think that there is a huge disconnect there. Um, and so my work with, um, with social entrepreneurs, um, but especially grassroots innovators, um, has shown that they are actually the ones who are capable of um, through a lot, you know, over a long, long, long time, so it's definitely something where we, we maybe need to look at how we can p give people time to develop the solutions, especially in a world where everything seems so urgent. 
uh, but they are the ones who seem to be um, the ones who actually are able to identify the right issues and then develop the right solutions for those. Got it. Um, Jagannath, would you like to jump into this? Yeah, I think uh, the important thing is uh, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that that disconnect is taken away. The disconnect is really in terms of uh, the developments that you see on one side in the startup world uh, and on the other side what you see at the grassroots in terms of the under-resourced uh, communities or the under-resourced micro-entrepreneurs, you might call them, in terms of what they are trying to do. So it's the capacity that I think uh, uh, that we have to provide. It is the access to the resources. It's about uh, giving them the capacity to absorb those resources, which gives them the agency to use the resources that are made available to them, uh, which is where uh, uh, all the stakeholders need to work together in order to connect these things. And when you have the capacity built amongst these people, and they are given the access. And here, here again, technology plays a big role in terms of uh, how we can do this. That's, you know, in a country like India, for example, if you want to make a difference, you've got to get scale. And technology offers that opportunity for us. So for, take, take financial access, financial resources, or the financial literacy, and the access to the financial resources to build any micro-enterprise, more so for the women. Now, one of the challenges is in terms of the whole uh, uh, credit evaluation part of it, because they don't have a credit record, and uh, so you can't give money to them, and so on and so forth. So how do you bridge this whole thing? So which is where uh, uh, the government schemes uh, of Jantan, Aadhaar, Mobile <coughs> combined with Mudra, and then use of potentially uh, AI techniques as, in, uh, as well, in terms of uh, the usage of uh, these people, uh, uh, in terms of their consumption patterns and so on, that's what needs to form the basis of their credit uh, evaluation. You, they can't provide documents, they can't provide collaterals, they can't provide uh, assets for uh, mortgage and so on. But at the same time, they need that initial capital to get going in terms of setting up their micro enterprises. If you go the old way in terms of looking for the collaterals, th there is no starting point only for them. And I think that's an important aspect that needs to be bridged. So on one side, you need to be building capacity in the people at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of understanding what, they are, uh, what resources they have access to or they can access, help them uh, access those resources and on the other side, Providers of capital, whoever they are, whether they could be government schemes, private capital, or otherwise, help them in terms of uh, uh, connecting with these people. And there, there are tools available. I mean, the tools need to be developed using technology, obviously, and uh, ensuring that these are connected. And when we have this, and you, again, use technology as a basis, for connecting these micro entrepreneurs with the markets and so on, then you are creating a virtuous cycle of economic activity. And potentially, you could have the next million entrepreneurs. Today, we all celebrate startups and unicorns and so on. So if you could celebrate a million uh, uh, women, for example, turning into unicorns, not in the form, in the, uh, form of capitalization of the marketplace, but in, in the form of uh, impacting maybe a million people. So that's the way to look at it. Uh, so it's about empowering the next million to then empower a million each. Yes. Yeah? It's a multiplier effect Got that it. you can Got create. It. Create a village. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sharin, um, population of 750,000 in Bhutan, do you share similar issues on the unserved, the underserved? Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here uh, with the uh, very esteemed uh, co-panelists. Uh, I have been in the uh, startup ecosystem in Bhutan for uh, quite some time. Uh, I led the first tech park and the first uh, incubation center that was set up in Bhutan in 2012. And um, uh, maybe I would like to quickly share some of the experiences uh, from a very small country uh, with a small population. So 
Uh, I think the challenges are a little different uh, for entrepreneurship in Bhutan. Uh, firstly, uh, the biggest challenge is a small market size. And uh, associated with that, I think, is the lack of a vibrant ecosystem. So the government has tried its best uh, to try and you know, build a more vibrant ecosystem. And uh, uh, in a country like Bhutan, small country, I think the uh, government has to play a key role because the private sector, uh, ability of the private sector to put in money uh, you know, for this kind of initiatives are quite limited. But despite that, the ecosystem, I would say, is still uh, not very vibrant. And uh, the other issue that we have is uh, the access to funding. And here, um, we don't have a community of investors. And even if there were, I think the kind of startups that come from a small country like Bhutan are not really the kind of startup that the investors are interested in. So investors. I have found uh, the conventional investors, they, they are looking at very highly scalable startups, highly scalable uh, kind of uh, business ideas. But uh, from a country like Bhutan, that's hard to come by. But at the same time, what I have noticed is the failure rate, although the startups from country like Bhutan don't scale up much, but the failure rate is much lower because uh, you know uh, they build a small business employ 10 to 20 people, and then they sustain. So that way, they are able to bring about a good impact in the society and the economy. But one of the gaps is that there are no investors who are interested in investing in this kind of businesses. I would like to leave at that. Thank Understood. You. Thank you. But what you're confirming is that there is a, a, a pyramid which exists, and there's a base of the pyramid, even in a 750,000 population country, where there are people who need to be served, right? and they're not uh, yet included. Yes, definitely. There are, there are a lot of people that need to be served, and the entrepreneurs, even in a country like Bhutan, are playing a big role in serving the uh, unserved. Understood. So let's let's move on to the gaps, right? And and uh, uh, Savannah, would you like to dive into what are the disconnects in the current ecosystem, right? We've been talking. It seems we've been talking about uh, the next billion and serving the unserved, underserved for a fairly long time. Uh, there clearly are disconnects. Why do you think they exist? And is there one pet peeve you have which you think needs to be fixed? And any suggestions on that? I'm excited to talk about that. But first, I want to, um, since we're talking about startups, uh, I just got my Be Real notification. For those of you that aren't 16 and don't know what Be Real is, it is the Gen Z social media app that is supposed to help people be real. So once a day you get a notification to take a photo of whatever's happening around you, and this just happens to be. So. <laughs> Gorgeous, thank you. Um, and you know, real, real problems with social media, so uh -huh. they're solving. Uh, in general, I want to pull this out to thinking about the gaps and how we're thinking about the ecosystem rather than focusing on one specific solution. So the tools and the thinking that got us to this place and have kind of ingrained us in the place that we are in the current ecosystem are not the same tools that are going to take us out. That's why we need to rethink how we think about the problem space, and we need to rethink the values that are underlying how we navigate the existing problem space and what we want for the future. We need to think about new incentives and new stakeholders in the type of mentality that we've had historically with startups, which is around scale and growth and move fast and do fast and you know, big is, bigger is better. I think that we need to shift how we're thinking about things so that we're designing with people for the planet and thinking about things in a way that you know could be slower or smaller scale or whatever it might be, but that that's okay. And we need to accept that when we are only designing for, or when we're only building for huge scale and we're only building for every market in the world, um, to be extreme in, in that type of speak, 
then we really miss out on bringing the right people into the room and we really miss out on how we are designing for and with the communities that we are trying to build with. So all of those incentive systems, those value systems need to be shifted to be more human and to really offer the right models for us to create the world that we want to live inside of. And I think that at the same time, we have all of these really new and interesting technology edges that we are starting to play with um, of Web3, of you know, the artificial intelligence revolution that's been happening and is coming and is moving. And especially as we think about these things that have even more dramatic potential for impact than things that we've seen in the past, it's even more important that we're paying attention to how we are designing and what we're building for, and there's a lot more intention behind how all of that works. And if we continue to just push for scale and growth, then we miss out on thinking about the ethical repercussions, the social repercussions, and what possible futures there might be that could be outside of that. So a lot of what my work is at IDEO is to design and to think about new possible futures. Um, and I do that in a way that is, you know, trying to build for, for the futures that we want to live in. And if we continue to just kind of rail against these existing metrics and think about that as like the system that we're building inside of and building for, then we don't get to imagine new types of possibilities. We don't get to have those examples of things that we might want to be building towards. And that means that those patterns continue to get replicated in other parts of the industry and other parts of the ecosystem and you know, in businesses that might look similar to one another. And so we need to shift our thinking in order to get to that space that is ultimately better for everybody. Thank you so much. So a reset in the thinking, right? So restructure, and Jagannath, you were talking about this as well, right? Restructure the thinking around the whole paradigm and the ecosystem uh, and reset it, yeah? Um, Christina, over to you. I'm happy to represent social entrepreneurs on stage today. It's great to be with you. And I have many friends in the startup world, and when they come to me to complain how hard their life is, I tell, if you think entrepreneurship is hard, just try social entrepreneurship. Well, there's many, many challenges and needs. As we've heard before, definitely social entrepreneurs need patient investors. Because we have this secret passion for really big, hairy problems, and they are usually systemic. They are not easy to solve, meaning that we have to engage with the whole ecosystem, with multiple stakeholders, understand different system dynamics, and all this takes time. So even if we are very persistent, we usually have to try many different, not doors, I would say windows, because we get kicked out quite uh, often, so we have to re-enter using many windows but it is not a linear process. And we were talking just before about this, right? So beyond, because yes, we have the vision, yes, we have the mission, yes, we are very ambitious and we are working hard every day. However, there are so many different elements in the ecosystems we engage with that are big question marks. So we don't know simply when we will be able to achieve, let's say, you know, even when we are starting a pilot project, sometimes it can take years. And I would say metrics of success then need to be built around value creation. So how do you measure the value you create when you change the lives of million, for example, millions of children in schools, in primary and secondary schools, what is the price that we as a society put on the future of humanity? So there's very important conversations to be, I think, hold with um, 
all ecosystem players and also with investors. And I would say startups and, and organizations like ours <coughs> struggle on so many levels because there is no accepted business model for what we are trying to achieve because we are really trying to support systems to change for the better but in an accelerated way because we like to move fast. So by the nature of things, we will you know, step on toes <laughs> and, and challenge many beliefs. But I think we also have this art of convincing people and inspiring and showing that it's possible, you know? And just to give perhaps a very concrete example of what we did in Switzerland, and this is something uh, we at EduCreators, we are very proud of. Uh, you know, we managed to create an open education initiative where we took computational thinking as a transversal skill, but then place it in the context of human smart cities so that we link it actually to SDGs, to real world problems. And then we also involved makerspaces and designed an open educational material. And we managed to bring it to public schools in one canton. We just started a pilot. And I think this shows that with the right, um, I would say, alliances, partnerships, with the right support on all levels, it is possible to change for the better and it is possible to do it fast. So another way I would say for us social entrepreneurs to succeed is to kind of stick together. And especially when you're looking at big topics like education, education, innovation, it is really important that we almost work together to understand the challenges, the needs of the ecosystem, and then together co-create. Together create something that makes sense and is accepted right away. And this is also that in Switzerland, uh, I think it's working really well where we have um, the Swiss EdTech Collider is um, an EdTech community, so community of EdTech entrepreneurs. It is anchored at uh, EPFL in Lausanne. This is one of the main leading uh, tech universities in the world. So it is anchored in research, science, especially uh, when we look at education. It is not using technology per se, you know, it is really going and looking and working together with uh, learning sciences to understand how can we best design and create learning experiences that are empowering. And this cannot be done in isolation. So getting on board researchers, local governments, national governments, and having also international partnerships is incredibly important for social entrepreneurs. Understood. So social entrepreneurs need to be empowered. They need to work in partnership with other social entrepreneurs. Uh, they need to not work in isolation and they need patient capital. Right? Yes. And alliances are important and involving the government is important. Excellent. Uh, Prerna, uh, saving the best for the last, go for it. <laughs> well, uh, hi everybody, I'm Prerna. And um, just for context setting, uh, I run a data startup uh, that works at the grassroots. So I tell policymakers and foundations what interventions or social programs or plans will work, what won't work. So I'm like a data auditor or an impact auditor, and I'm set up as a for-profit. So my viewpoint is very distorted in that sense. And I have three comments uh, based on all that's been said. Uh, the first is about a very distorted narrative that we're all privy to, right? What are the startups? that we see on our television, what are the startups um, that we are exposed to, think about the ads that you see on TV, think about the hoardings that you see, right? It's about food delivery startups, right? But if you get into numbers, how many cities, locations are these startups catering to? 10, 40, 50, 100? When you talk about your ed tech startups, it's maybe 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million children, but India is a very, very, very big country, right? So when we talk about our unicorns, we're not really talking about our startups that are meant for the superset of this country, 65% of which lives you know, it's in, in its uh, rural parts, right? 
And again, if I was just to zoom in a little bit more, 65% of India lives in, uh, you know, uh, rural parts. Only about 50% of those people have access to the internet, and only 25% of those 50% actually use the internet actively. And then if you drill it down further, uh, the numbers for women and for children are, uh, you know, even <coughs> smaller, right? So when we're talking about our startups, are we really talking about access that this superset needs? No, not so much, right? It's, it's probably because it's not so cool to talk about these guys, but then again, is there a business opportunity? Yes, there is, and I think that's been talked about, so I'm going to skip that. My second comment is about, you know, um, a gap in expectations from both sides, from the startup side and from the investor side, right? The investors, are they really going into the hinterlands of India? Maybe not so much, right? Who are the, uh, you know, what are the kind of startups these investors are exposed to? It's those that are available online, use the internet really well, are, you know, well-spoken, went to the good schools, right? So right there, you're lopping off a lot of your social sector startups that cater to this superset, right? Um, at the other end, have these social sector startups really been able to meet targets or has a majority of this given, giving been in the form of grant making? Right when you give a grant, I think you kind of set an expectation that I may or I need not hit a certain milestone. I think that expectation is Gotham is changing in a very big way. We now have a corporatization, if I may say, of our social sector startups, wherein we might be giving them money, but there is an expectation of a return. We expect them to scale to X number of locations, to Y number of beneficiaries, or you know, have a reach of Z or Z square or Z cube over a period of time. And I think that's very, very important if we are, again, you know, to look at this super set of people, right? From the point of view of investors, I think we spoke about patient capital. The multiples that one can expect from a social sector startup are very different from that which one can expect from, you know, a digitally driven urban uh, startup, uh, you know, catering to uh, urban population, so might, one might say, right? And as much as we are willing to concede to those facts, I think there's a lot of merit that exists in startups that have come up. For instance, I have a friend who runs a startup, and the only thing that they do is tell people about the kind of subsidies that they currently have access to, right? So all they're doing is they'll go into these different households and tell people, listen, that you can make X amount of money if you simply start accessing uh, this subsidy that the government has given you access to, right? So just trying to solve this massive problem of information asymmetry is what the startup is doing. They've raised a bunch of million dollars and, you know, they scale to a couple of million people. So a lot of these cool startups do exist. Um, my third comment is about the role of the government. Uh, I think Mr. Jagannath said this a little bit earlier outside, right, that we have philanthropic giving, we have impact funds, we have social sector investments happening, da, da, da. But if you want systemic change, if you're looking at hundreds and millions of people on the lines of what India is home to, you need the government to be part of this growth story, right? If you need to reach out to those, all those nooks and crannies across the country, across the developing world, it has to be systemic and it has to be sustainable. And I think the government's already doing that. For, so, for instance, now you have something uh, on the lines of a, uh, you know, SSE, which is the social sector stock exchange, which basically means that you, as the impact investor, if you want to invest in a socially driven startup, they need to give you those metrics. If those metrics are really cool, if they're scaling, if their reach is going up, you can go in and invest, and a lot of investors will compete for that startup, right? So like I said earlier, corporatization of socially driven missions. I think if we can sort of look at all these things combined and, and, and sort of give it that runway of a couple of years, uh, we're on the right track. Yeah, over to you, please. Right, so do we have that couple of years? So that's my next point, and uh, Jagannath, I'm going to bring you into this. Is there a stakeholder disconnect, right, on the push for profit, scaling, scaling with a very different definition, growth, versus the ability to give the startups or the social entrepreneur enough oxygen to come up with the right business model, have meaningful impact in a sustainable basis without yanking the rug, right? And if there is this disconnect, can you think about how we 
think about facilitating this, involving the government, the four pillars you were addressing earlier? Yeah, I think uh, we need a mindset, mindset shift here. Uh, in terms of thinking about uh, this space, uh, a lot of my colleagues here on the panel spoke of uh, uh, the social enterprises, social stock exchanges, and then uh, along with that, you can also look at this whole uh, uh, outcome-based funding business, right? The, now we have, we are seeing the emergence of uh, uh, impact bonds and outcome-based financing happening with risk investors bringing initial capital, and then there is outcome-based financing happening. But the important thing is uh, to address the specific question of uh, uh, revenue, growth, profitability, and then the impact. What's most important uh, for us is if we want to make this shift, mindset shift, I mean, uh, we have to first focus on the impact. And uh, with, uh, how do you get there? And how can we actually structure uh, the whole model around the impact itself and work backwards as to what does it take us? Uh, in terms of creating the models of doing business, whether it, it's not just about the social enterprises, the business that they are in, their, their, their business is to generate that impact, and who are the other actors who are contributing to the success of these social enterprises. So they need to be reoriented, is what I mean when I said uh, mindset shift. It certainly needs that patient capital. It needs a re reorientation from uh, looking at profit from the word goat uh, to actually starting to see the change. and create a sustainable business model. It's not so much about profit growth, it's about sustainable enterprise, creation of sustainable enterprise, so that they are able to kind of run on their own, and then you can move on creating, uh, creating uh, more enterprises, actually. So you need to create that kind of uh, multiplier effect through this uh, uh, process, in fact. So that change needs to happen. Uh, if we are looking at, I, uh, one of the colleagues mentioned about uh, it can't be, uh, it, that it is not a linear uh, model. You cannot apply a linear model here. And you can't have a fixed repayment schedule. You, you, you can't have fixed returns. You can't have, uh, you know, uh, valuations uh, from the word go kind of thing. So this is the shift if you can bring, differentiate the fact that if we want to make large scale impact and impact the people at scale in terms of the outcomes that they can get, whether it is education, whether it is health care, whether it is overall livelihoods uh, and well-being and so on, all these things, start measuring in terms of in improvements or changes you can see, let's say, in educational outcomes, changes in health care outcomes, uh, changes in uh, overall uh, incomes of the people. Uh, particularly focused on the rural uh, communities and the women, more so women, creating that agency and what changes those women can make in their communities. And so, so when we start measuring results on those terms, that's when I think we'll start, start seeing the uh, uh, growth, emergence and growth of more of these uh, social so enterprises. Capital needs to be smart enough to be linked to impact-related outcomes. Yes. Yeah. And that's the mindset shift you, you're referring to, right? We need to see the outcomes which we will deliver from an impact perspective, and that's where the next tranche drawdown happens. Uh, we need risk appetite for first loss, second loss. That has to come from government, right? Uh, got it. Uh, Regina, would you like to jump into this? And then Savannah after that? And can we just limit it to a minute each so that uh, we all get a... <laughs> Yes, um, I'll be brief, said the academic, but she lied. Um, I think that uh, there is this particular thing about grassroots innovators um, that makes them continue to fly under the radar of academia and industry, but also decision makers. Um, and that is that they're often, through very political work, even if we're talking about innovations that are so interesting for society, they also uncover a lot of uncomfortable truths that um, especially decision makers don't really want to see, they don't really want these things to, to be talked about. Um, and so I think that this is where, um, um, you know, we just need to face these problems. Um, maybe the solutions are incremental, maybe they are, you know, scalable in a way that um, they can be reproduced elsewhere. Um, of course, always thinking in terms of the context relevance of the incremental solutions. but. 
these, you know, we just need to we just need to start supporting them, however difficult it might be for, especially for politicians, because of course, again, these systemic problems are being uncovered, and so it's an extremely political and therefore, in a political sense, also dangerous place to be in. But I mean, how are we going to, you know, change systems if we are not addressing exactly those issues? So Anna? I actually want to again do something non-traditional um, and I want to push that question back to you knowing that we only have a few more minutes um, sure. because it would be really interesting to hear the perspective of somebody who is in the VC world and you know can, I've, I've heard your perspectives and your ability to kind of think from all sides of the equation so would love to hear from you. Yeah sure so I, I um, and thank you for that. No I, I think um, uh, Capital flows to where the opportunities are. Yeah, it requires a very different mindset from the LP down to the fund manager uh, to then ensure that that capital allocation is happening uh, with purpose and patience. And I I think there can be funds which are fully devoted to that, but then the LPs also want to return, right? And if you want the fund wants to raise the next fund and thereafter, there has to be a mix of returns. So some of the funds I've seen succeed are those who have a certain allocation. Uh, towards impact, which is a bit more patient, which is a bit more purpose-driven, uh, and then that helps solve the equation, right? Uh, not fully, but you know, these are baby steps. I also think the LPs, which in this case are a lot of the pension funds, the big asset managers, etc., uh, have to also drive down uh, the mandate, right? Whether it's investing uh, in diversity, in women-led funds to solve certain problems which women understand best, uh, in impact. Uh, and then maybe that mindset change around resetting expectations, the measurement which Perna was referring to, all of that has to come to the equation. Uh, at the end of the day, capital is all about returns. If there are foundations giving grants, grants are viewed as not accountable, uh, perpetual, uh, and can go into that black hole where you know they can just be left unattended. So I think there has to be a discipline between grants uh, and a mix of accountability and Yes, the hardest thing to do in the impact space is to drive returns and to deliver returns. That does require patience and purpose-driven capital. Uh, and I think we need a lot more of that to happen. But it can start with, for example, a 5% allocation from the Black Rocks, the Black Stones, uh, the Wellingtons, the Fidelities, right? It can start from there and then trickle down. We also need a wider base of funds which are focused on impact. They need to have investable funds to invest in. The funds have enough opportunities because there are lots of social entrepreneurs, the brave, the brave hearts, yeah. Uh, and you know, there's a paucity of women-run uh, funds, right? We need to see that happening because that lens and the opportunities that it will uh, search out for investing opportunities will be very different, and that's, I think, a lot of what we need. So can I? Ditto. Now? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Is that okay? So can I move on now to? Um, uh, Christina, because you had a pretty strong feeling about the funding aspect of your uh, ecosystem. Yes, and perhaps, you know, as a closing remark, if I may, I'm an optimist, and I, I truly believe that we are getting close to, uh, you know, a time where we are going to have safe spaces for exploration experimentation and co-creation for social entrepreneurs. It's not the case today, and especially, you know, for women and underrepresented, you know, minorities, it is very challenging because as a social entrepreneur, you're usually putting also, you know, it's your life, you're, you're not getting um, too many insurances, you're out there, you're taking a big risk on a personal level. And if you have family and obligations, you have to make some tough choices. So I truly believe in a future and in a near future where we will have these um, safe spaces for co-creation, exploration, and support for social entrepreneurs. And these are going to be spaces where from day one, stakeholders will come together and will not work in silos. Got it. No, I think absolutely right. We all have to be optimists. We are all optimists uh, because this is the mission which uh, which we are on. 
Uh, and I think we, you know, we come back in a year and have a report card discussion around where, what progress we made over the last one year. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, apologies, we couldn't take audience questions, but I can request the panel to stay on on the side and we can um, then take questions. Do we have time for questions or no? Apologies, but we'll be here. Yeah. Uh, my